this last section of, of 4.1 deals with the social and the uh, cultural changes that we're going to experience in Western Europe primarily. Because they're going to have a lot more money flowing around, all right? Where is Western Europe bringing in all this extra money uh, starting in the 1400s into the 1500s, 1600s, and 1700s? Yeah, they've explored, they've conquered new lands, they're, they're extracting resources, they're, they're becoming more important in global trade. They're rolling in dough. And because of this, we're going to see, uh, we're gonna see some new um, artistic endeavors, some new literary endeavors, some new scientific endeavors that, that wouldn't have happened in a, in a Europe of the Middle Ages that just didn't have that kind of resources to devote to something. We're going to start with talking about the Renaissance. All right, we haven't really spent much time on the Renaissance. We're only going to be there briefly. The Renaissance is a word that derives from the French language, right? Meaning? Rebirth. 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 Very good. You guys all probably know that in downtown Detroit, we have a building called the Renaissance Center, right? It's the General Motors headquarters today. That was built in the early 1970s after the Detroit riots. And it, the hope was that that Renaissance Center would lead to a rebirth in downtown Detroit. It did absolutely the opposite. It's, it's off, off to the side of the city, essentially. It's totally, like, enclosed. You literally can get yourself lost wandering around the Renaissance Center, around all of its circles. You almost feel trapped within it. It didn't bring any new investment or development downtown. So that one didn't work. But the real Renaissance did a lot. Yes, ma'am? Um, what standard is this? 417. So it, it means rebirth. It originates in Italy. It originates in Italy in the very late May, or 1300s, early 1400s. And it's going to spread to the north from there. Now, we talked about the mid-1300s. There was a disaster that befell Italy and other parts of Europe known as the, the Black Death or the Black Plague. Very good, the bubonic plague. Well, in yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, like after the book that you read. Yeah, it's after the era of the Mongols where we're getting into that. Now, and, but it's certainly after the strong connections between East and West had been formed during the Pax Mongolica. Pax Mongolica is over. Um, following the Black Death, European urban areas are going to see a resurgence in population. Okay, their populations are going to start to rebound. And new wealth is going to start to enter European cities, largely through increased merchant activity. And it shouldn't surprise us that much of this starts in Italy. Because Italy, being a peninsula on the Mediterranean Sea, is primed for being active in the Mediterranean Sea trades. Right? So they're, they're making a lot of money off of merchant activity in the Mediterranean Sea. So it is out of Italy that much of this begins. And... and and what we need to focus on with the idea of the Renaissance, and which really is going to drive us through the rest of today's discussion, is what is known as humanism. 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 Like humanism. Humanism refers to a focus on endeavors of us, on, on human endeavors, on what we do, on what we are which is a dramatic change from earlier ages, like in the, in, the dar in the Middle Ages, right? When individuals in Western Europe were more so focused on what rather than their own lives. What, was, what do you think was central to Europeans' focus uh, before this Renaissance period, before the humanist era? Religion is everything. Yeah, you got to eat day to day. But ultimately, your greatest concerns is living a life that will allow you to enter the kingdom of heaven upon your death. Right? So your life centers on religion. Your life centers on the afterlife. With the Renaissance and with notions of humanism, this is going to change. A new focus on us as individuals, humans as crucial beings on this planet, will begin to rise. Now, this does not replace necessarily religion. The Renaissance and humanism and spirituality can coexist at the same time. All right? But it does start to chip away at some of the central tenets of what the Roman Catholic Church had been long telling people in Western Europe. And we'll talk about that in a moment. We're going to see this most influenced early on in artistic forms in Western Europe. 
Um, I've just got a couple pictures of, of what we consider pre-Renaissance art, and much of it will look like this. Um, very flat. You guys notice there's not a whole lot of like depth and perspective in here. Um, it's obviously a religious-themed piece, because who do we have here? Mary. Mary, and there's baby Jesus, right? Um, you're going to look, though, at all, like, if you look at Mary's face, if you look at the baby Jesus, who a lot of these pre-Renaissance uh, Jesus paintings, baby Jesus paintings, baby Jesus looks like an old man. Uh, he doesn't look like a bouncy little cute baby. Um, and then you've got, obviously, all of these saints surrounding them. And they all have their halos um, uh, around their heads. This is pre-Renaissance art. Yes? Yeah, that's, that's a good question, because in many she does, and this one she doesn't. Um, I, and I don't know enough about this painting to answer that question. Um, here we have another one, and, and again, Mary's not, still not featured with, with that. Um, and again, it's very flat. If, if you were trying to draw like an exact representation of the human form, and this is what you produced, Miss Kahn would probably not give you the highest grade, all right? This is pre-Renaissance art. The focus wasn't on us. It wasn't on humanity. It was on the spiritual. All right? So you didn't have to worry about exactly replicating us if you were worried about, like, the spiritual realm. Now, does that mean that, like, European artists didn't have any idea that you could do exact representations of humanity? No, of course. <laughs> when, when were people doing exact representations of humanity? like in, through art and sculpture and such, that, that people in Italy might have had contact with. Absolutely in Rome. Absolutely in Rome. So the Renaissance, one aspect of the Renaissance and one like, aspect that drove this notion of humanism is a reconnection with the classical world. And we talked about this at the beginning of the year. Classical Greece, classical Rome. For much of Western European history, that stuff starts to vanish in importance. But by the 1400s, there's this reconnection and newfound interest in looking at what they were up to. All right? And in their artwork, we're going to see the, the exact depictions of, of humanity and, and, and far greater realism in, in the art of the Renaissance. This is a painting called The School of Athens. Athens is, of course, in where? Raphael. Greece. Guy uh, painted by a guy named Raphael. You guys know he's one of the turtles, right? And we're gonna we're gonna go through through all of the turtles except for Donatello. I'm sorry. Um, I know, I know. Anyway, the School of Athens. Uh, in in the School of Athens, Raphael depicts the great philosophers of ancient Greece all together and talking to each other and having a conversation with Socrates front and center. We're going to start to see a new realism in, in art with this reconnection to classical Greek uh, and, and Roman works. Uh, you guys all know this guy. I spared you from the full view. Uh, he is uh, Michelangelo's David. Now, this is an important thing to note. Michelangelo's David. Obviously, I mean, that is, is pretty realistic, right? That looks like a guy. That looks exactly like a guy. Like, proportions in the human form is, is crucial. But who is David, as depicted by Michelangelo? Jesus. He's a guy from the Bible. Does anybody know what guy from the Bible David is? King David. King David. He's a pretty important guy in the Old Testament, right? He, he, was, uh, he was the king of, of Israel. A couple other works here that you guys should be familiar with. Um, this is, uh, he killed Goliath, yes. Uh, this is the Sistine Chapel in, in Rome. Again, everything within the Sistine Chapel is, is religiously inspired, painted by Michelangelo as he's holed up on his back on, upon scaffolds painting the ceiling. It's certainly religiously inspired, but with a focus on like replicating the human form and a focus on what we really are. Humanism starting to put people uh, more at the forefront uh, rather than merely uh, religion. Here's a, uh, just a, a solid image of, of the entire ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. And you guys probably would most recognize this right front and center, right? Uh, this is the creation of man. Uh, so there's God and Adam and everybody's working out well. Um, 
Leonardo da Vinci, you guys are familiar with him. He's another one of the Ninja Turtles. Um, also another important... Uh, uh, you what? You have that one? Or like a copy of it? Yeah, not the real one. That would be, that would be ridiculous. Every house has this thing. Where? Is the real one? Is the real one at the Louvre? No, I think it's in Rome. The real one's in Rome? Okay. I don't know that. Uh, so anyway, uh, this is Leonardo da Vinci and his Last Supper. Obviously, it's the Last Supper of Jesus. There's religious tinges here. But Leonardo da Vinci, maybe as much as anybody during the Renaissance, was interested in, in replicating the human form. The Renaissance is also going to influence uh, literary works. All right? It's in Milan. In Milan. Thank you. The Renaissance is also going to influence literary works, largely due to the spread of the printing press, but we will talk about a couple works that, that predate Gutenberg's printing press. We remember we talked uh, before the development of the printing press in the late 1400s, we've got all books in Western Europe having to be handwritten, all right? And that takes a lot of time, and that, takes, that makes them very expensive. So books were at once rare, and books were very expensive. But then Gutenberg develops the printing press, and the printing press technology is going to spread throughout Western Europe, and guess what? We start making a lot more books. So the prices in books begins to drop, and they become more reasonable for regular people to get their hands on them. So with the, more, with the greater avail availability of books, we're going to have the spread of literacy in Western Europe. So more and more people are going to be able to read. Now, don't get me wrong. Most people still can't read because most people have no time in their day when their life is sent, uh, centered on like working on their, on their fields. Most people don't have such time, all right, and, and certainly don't have any ability to get that education. But the numbers of Europeans that are going to gain the ability to read is going to grow. Also, we're going to see more and more books, once the printing press comes around, that are written and printed in the vernacular. And that's a word you should, again, be familiar with. We talked about it the other day. The language of the community. So if you're in, in uh, Berlin, the vernacular is German. If you're in France, in Avignon, the vernacular is French. If you're in the United States, the vernacular is some English. butchered form of English, right? <laughs> So more and more books will be in the vernacular, which is going to make it easier for more individuals to begin to be able to read in their own language. I want to run through a few important works of, of the Renaissance period that will be um, either influential just because they're some of the first, um, or because they'll inspire uh, later, later works. Uh, this is a guy named Dante Alighieri, and his work called The Divine Comedy. Now, this was written back in the 1300s, 1320, actually before the, uh, the worst of the Black Plague set in. All right, so this, this is actually a pre-Renaissance, but a sign of things to come. Dante's Divine Comedy is, the, is, is a book about Dante himself and his journey through the three levels of Catholic Christianity after life. Uh, hell, or he called, what Dante called in Italian? Inferno, Inferno very good. And uh, Purgatorio, this kind of middle zone that, that uh, Catholics would end up into upon their death before they either entered into hell or paradise or paradiso. Yes, ma'am. Don, uh, the Divine Comedy is Dante's journey through these three realms of the Catholic afterlife, hell, purgatory, and, and heaven, or paradise. Is it funny? Um, no, no, no. Yes. I think also it, it, it has like a lot of humanist characteristics. Absolutely. Like, like love and like Absolutely. and desire and, combined and with the... Like, um, the spiritual realm. And, and that's where we can connect that notion of humanism because... This is Dante, like, thinking and writing about what he thinks these aspects of life, or the afterlife, will be to him as an individual. And he, as an individual, experiencing them, sharing that notion. Uh, okay, another one. Uh, up in England, again, this predates the printing press, as you can see here, in that it's, like, handwritten. This is uh, Geoffrey Chaucer. That's Geoffrey, G-E-O, like the Toys R Us guy, Geoffrey. G-E-O-F-F-R-E-Y, Geoffrey Chaucer, and his Canterbury Tales. 
You guys ever read any of the Canterbury Tales in your English class? Can't read it. It's like in old English. Well, yeah, there's updated versions. And, and, and it's not actually, like, the English isn't that. It's not old English like, uh, like a Beowulf will be, like, oh, yeah. virtually impossible to read. Uh, but, yeah, you can read updated versions. The Canterbury Tales is a series of tales about um, some pilgrims in England making their way to visit... Um, the tomb of a guy named Thomas of Becket. He was a former Archbishop of Canterbury. That's not, that point doesn't matter to us. What matters to us is through the tales, again, there's a focus in his work on human relationships and human interactions, right? The focus on us, not merely the spiritual afterlife that we all would have strived for in the 1300s when this is written. So it's a focus on human endeavors again. Yes? Yes? Absolutely. I think, I think you, can, you can absolutely say that. Absolutely. Um, another work you guys should be familiar with is Niccolo Machiavelli's The Prince. You can call oh, him yes. Machiavelli. Oh, yeah. Cross talked about this. Yes, well, it's very important to the development of uh, modern states. The Prince. Niccolo Machiavelli was in Italy and in 1517. Hey, that's the same year that... that uh, the, the 95 Theses were nailed onto the wall of the, or the door of the church in Wittenberg, Germany by Martin Luther. In 1517 in Italy, Niccolo Machiavelli is writing a work called The Prince that serves as a, a reference point for future leaders, like how you should effectively rule. And in his work, he encourages rulers to be focused on their own self-interest and preservation of their rule. Now, reading The Prince, you would get, like, you, you get the message that Machiavelli thinks you should rule harshly. You should rule with that iron fist. You should be a strong ruler because weak rulers can be deposed, essentially. So the point here is how do we connect this with the Renaissance? It's Machiavelli encouraging rulers to focus on what works out best for them like continuing their rule. Not necessarily what works out best for them to appease God or appease the church or anything like that. Again, it's this focus on the human rather than focus on, on uh, the spiritual. In England, again, Sir Thomas More writes a book called Utopia. You guys have all heard the word utopia, meaning like a perfect society. That originates with Sir Thomas More coining the word. His utopia is about the creation of the perfect um, society made by man, not necessarily like created by the hand of God. So again, this humanist aspect that individuals can actually improve their lot in life. And then you are all familiar with this guy. We're not going to talk much about him, but who is he? Looks like a pirate. No, it's William Shakespeare. Yeah, very good. Um, and William Shakespeare really kind of comes at the end of this Renaissance period um, in, in Northern Europe. He's writing during what we call the Elizabethan Age in England, when, when Queen Elizabeth was the Queen of England, really right around the year 1600 and, and in the years after. We won't spend too much time talking about him because you cover him in English, I'm sure. You guys have already read Romeo and Juliet, I believe? Yeah. Cool, and I believe you'll read Hamlet when you're seniors. So there you go. You got a couple. This increased uh, literacy, like as more and more of these works are written, and guys, this is only scratching the surface, this increase in literacy is going to increase a demand for books. An increase in the demand for books is going to create more books being written and printed, and more books being written and printed is going to increase literacy. And an increase in literacy is going to increase the demand for books, and more books being printed is going to increase the demand for literacy, and more literacy is going to increase the demand for books. Do we see how this kind of goes hand in hand right now? All right, good. This will also develop or influence the development of the Protestant Reformation, which we talked about the other day, guys. This focus on individualism, this focus on the self, that's much of what the Protestant Revolution or Protestant Reformation was about. That that an individual himself should be able to read his Bible in his own language 
and get understandings from that rather than having it come through a middleman of a Catholic priest. And so we get Martin Luther starting the Protestant Reformation with ideas that an individual through his own good works and his own relationship with God can achieve uh, the, the, the kingdom of heaven. We talked about the Protestant Reformation the other day. We're not going to go back into that too much more deeply here. Yeah? You were talking about um, like Protestant Reformation having changing the Bible to their, their own language. Then what about Catholic? Do they still read Latin? Or like, later on you said that? Uh, again, yeah, eventually there's going to be, uh, the Catholic Church says our, church, our faith can be practiced in the vernacular. Um, most, most, you know, I, I don't know when... Um, most Catholics would start having non-Latin Bibles in their house. But remember, the reality is most people wouldn't have Bibles still. I, I, and most people weren't reading it on their own and, until more of the modern day. Um, yeah, go ahead. Okay, can you use this as an example to say how like, the religion is like a definition of something that people don't I like that. The religion uh, with the Protestant Reformation and, and after the age of humanism, the religion adapts more to people's lives rather than people adapting to the religious order. Um, I, I like that. Now, this is not across the board. Remember, the Roman Catholic Church is still there. The Roman Catholic Church is still, and still to this day, the biggest Catholic denom or Christian denomination on the planet. So this is not like, whoa, everybody's going to change overnight. No, most people are still going to remain Catholics in Europe. Um, all right, another... Um, change that's going to be uh, spurred because of this uh, 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 desire to focus on the human endeavor and on the world around us a little bit more is going to be what's known as the scientific revolution. I believe you guys cover a lot of this in ninth grade science class or maybe 10th, I don't know. Uh, again, inspired by humanism. And also, ironically enough, the growth of universities. The first universities were born in Europe in the, during the high Middle Ages. And these were places of, of higher education, but most of them were sanctioned and supported by the Roman Catholic Church. Kind of interesting there, right? Um, and, and it is at many of these universities that a lot of this thinking that will start to go counter of what the Catholic Church had long been espousing uh, will, will be born. So Europeans are, being now, are now focusing more on the natural world and the world around them and human endeavors. And it comes to it bring them to many new scientific realizations. Uh, this guy, I don't have a picture of him, sorry. Nicholas Copernicus. It's a guy you should have all heard of before, I'm sure. Um, before, the, uh, before this age, this is how most Western Europeans viewed the world viewed the, the, the universe around them, or at least the solar system. And you guys can't really read this, and it is in Latin, uh, but you've got the earth in the middle, right? Because we're like the most important, because we're here and we're like self-centered, right? So we must think we're the most important. And, and like when you read the Bible, like we're the most important creation of God, right? Why would God put his most cre important creation off to the corner of something? Obviously, we're front and center. And as we look up in the night sky or in the day sky, what do we see happening to the sun and the moon? Moving. They're moving around us, right? That's absolutely what it looks like. Because we just at that time didn't have an understanding that the earth that we were standing upon was actually moving too. Like you guys all recognize we're moving right now, each of us, at about 1,000 miles per hour, right? Like, what's that? A lot, A lot more than that? I don't think so. Going through space, yeah. Oh, oh, well, like going through, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I mean, rotating on the Earth's axis. We're all, we're all spinning around at about 1,000 miles per hour. But none of us are getting dizzy. Why? What do you mean by that? We're used to it. We just, like, one, once you get used to spinning 1,000 miles per hour, you're okay with it? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, very good. Like, just like you guys, when you're in a car that's going 80 miles an hour, it doesn't feel like you're going 80 miles an hour, but if you were to step out of that car going 80 miles an hour, you would very quickly feel, whoa, I was going pretty fast, and ow, that hurt. Um, because in relation to what we are on, whether you're going in an 80 mile an hour car or you're going on in a 1,000 mile an hour rotating planet, in relation to what we're on, we're moving the same. So as long as we're moving 1,000 miles an hour and the planet's moving 1,000 miles an hour, it doesn't seem like we're doing anything, right? 
Well, you wouldn't really have had this understanding until other people figured this out and explained this understanding to all of us. Because it looks certainly to us like the sun moves around us and the moon moves around us. And so for centuries, this is the Ptolemaic model. This guy Ptolemy, he was an astronomer back in, in, in the Greek ages. Put Earth at the center. And then you got the, the, uh, the Luna, the moon. And then they knew Mercury was there. But that just looked a little further in. Venus, and then the Sun, and then Mars, and Jupiter, and Saturn. So they knew some things were out there. They could see them. But it all looked like it moved around us. All right? Until Nicholas Copernicus, Copernicus came around. Now, don't get me wrong. This is me being totally Eurocentric. Copernicus is really important for the development of this science in Europe. Arab astronomers had already figured this stuff out. All right? Yeah. They were already down with this. All right? They had already worked a lot of this out. And, and some believe that Copernicus based a lot of his understandings on having contact and, and, and being able to see some of the work of these earlier Arab astronomers. But anywho, for Europeans, we care about the European guy. Nicholas Copernicus was a Polish guy. So those of you that are Polish, what, what? He's your guy, right? You know about Copernicus. He's a big deal. Hear about it. Like, you probably have a whole day devoted to how exciting Nicholas Copernicus was, right? There's a, how big is he? He's a big deal. All right, who, who would you say is like number two of Polish astronomers or Polish scientists? Mary Curie. Mary Curie? She's Polish? I didn't know she was Polish. Why did I think she was French? Was her, was her husband French? Yeah. Okay, that's why I thought she was French. And look at me, look at me being sexist and thinking because the husband is French, she has to be French too. What's wrong with me? Okay, anyway. So the Copernican model of the solar system rightfully puts the sun right in the center of it all. And then you got Mercury and Venus, and then you got us, and you go on from there. Now, how is this wrong? What, what's wrong about this Copernican model? I'm sorry, Polish kids, there was something wrong about it. It's written in Latin. Yes, ma'am? Yeah, we have, like, an elliptical orbits, right? But we'll get there in a little bit. Thank you, Mr. Newton. Um, but anyhow... Uh, Nicholas Copernicus is a guy you should be familiar with because he said the center is not the, the earth, it's actually the sun. Now, what does this do to Christian dogma? Christian dogma, like the thinking of Christianity. Yeah. Yeah. This, is, this is controversial. Because why, again, would God put his most important creation like at a random spot, not even in the middle of anything, Right? Why? Does this mean the sun is now the most important? Or does this mean these planets that are closer to the sun, which gives us life, is now more important? I don't know. This, this is a challenging assertion, right? When Galileo, here's another guy you should know, Galileo Galilei. Galileo in 1632. Galileo's Italian. Shh, guys, quiet, please. When Galileo begins to work with the same understandings of Nicholas Copernicus before him, but begins to use his telescope and, and connect to some, some uh, use some mathematics to uh, get a greater understanding of the actual distances of these uh, objects in, in space. And Galileo also is going to talk about how the Earth is actually rotating on its axis. And so all we are doing is watching, like we're spinning, the sun isn't moving around us. Galileo, being close to Rome, would actually be condemned by the Roman Catholic Church and spend much of his life essentially in house arrest, still doing his research, but not free to, uh, to continue his teachings um, in society. Because it challenged the church's idea that earth and mankind was the center of God's creation. Because Nicholas Copernicus was in Poland a couple hundred years before, or a hundred years before. Um, so, so Galileo is like right in the heart of Roman Catholic Christianity. Yeah. Also, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's because it, it, this, it sounds small, like the wild wild church will condemn people for that. But essentially what he's doing is he's challenging the legitimacy of the church. Sure. And, and he, proves that this, he proves the church wrong, then, then 
uh, everyone's going to start doubting about all the churches. Teaching. It's and and guys, the church needs to collect money every Sunday, right? And so if you have people starting to question one aspect of religious teachings, why might not they not question everything? So it, it's definitely scary. And notice Galileo in 1632. What is the Roman Catholic Church dealing with in 1632? The, the effects of the Protestant Reformation. They've already hemorrhaged. The church is already split. They don't want to continue losing followers. So we can understand where they're coming from. We also have during this era, and I got a nice little elementary science picture here for you, the development of what is known as the scientific method. Earlier thinking, you guys know about this, we don't need to go into it. Earlier scientific endeavors prior to this age said we can understand the world around us by just using our reason, just reasoning it, just thinking about it, right? The scientific method and the scientific revolution says that that is not enough. You actually need, like, empirical evidence that can be replicated. You have to experiment. You have to, like, a guy doing one experiment here has to come up with the same results as a guy doing the same experiment somewhere else trying to create some order in the natural world that can be documented and experimented with. So the scientific method is an important development of this age known as the scientific revolution. This is probably the big daddy of them all, Sir Isaac Newton. Look how big he is, man. I don't know. I, mean, I can't tell how big he is there. He could be five foot one. We don't, we don't, I don't know how tall he is. Sir Isaac Newton is an English guy. Scottish guy, actually, I think. Uh, Sir Isaac Newton, Sir Isaac Newton is going to do a, uh, among a number of important things, like understanding, beginning to understand what gravity is, the force of gravity. Also describing the, the laws of motion that you guys are all familiar with today from your physics class last year. Galileo, or pardon me, Isaac Newton also, because a lot of this work that previous scientists had done is just hard stuff, especially with the tools that, that they had at their disposal. Galileo invents a new form of mathematics to begin to figure out and prove the work of previous scientists. Calculus. This is called calculus. Oh, yes, <laughs> Newton invents calculus. It's English. Yeah. English, thank you. Newton invents calculus. Now, I want you to stop for a moment and recognize what an endeavor that is. There was no such math that had existed to explain much of the natural world. So Newton created it. All right? Now, there's another guy, and I believe, gosh, he was Polish. Do you guys know a guy named Leibniz? Or was he German? This guy named Leibniz who was doing it at the same time. He might have been. He's German. Um, who, de who developed it like right about the same time. And a lot of it was very similar between what uh, uh, Newton did and what Leibniz did. Uh, but anyway, Newton gets the credit for developing calculus. And he, his new calculus is going to allow him to uh, prove the work of earlier scientists. Now, one last note to talk about during this age of scientific endeavors. How do you reconcile all of these new scientific understandings with the religion that you have long practiced? And we will see the development of a new religious idea called deism. Thomas Jefferson loves that. Thomas Jefferson was a deist. Deism, D-E-I-S-M. Deism. The notion that there is still a God. There is that creator God that started it all. But the deists believe that the God that created it all was much like a watchmaker. A watchmaker would assemble the pieces of a watch and then wind it up and then it would just start working. And once that watch starts working, once that watch is wound and its mechanisms all begin to work, nothing else influences it. The watchmaker doesn't go back to the watch to reset it or tinker with it anymore. It just works forevermore. All right? And so the deist God, the watchmaker God establishes the laws of nature. The laws of nature that, that Newton and others were working out. The deist God establishes those laws of nature. And then they just work. They, it just continues forevermore. Those laws don't change. God still created them in the beginning. But this is starting to take away the view that many Christians had that 
God could act upon a whim, that God could change your fortunes, all right, or, or, or you, that, that even things like prayer uh, could actually have any influence because the idea of prayer in, like, Christian thinking says that through your prayers, there could be influence and change brought from God. Well, a watchmaker, God isn't in there meddling. That's, the, everything is just set up to go forward from the beginning. Now, don't get me wrong, and please understand this throughout all this conversation. Does the Catholic Church exist throughout all of this? Absolutely. Do, do the Protestant churches exist through all of this that certainly don't agree with this Nate, notion? Absolutely. But what are we starting to see more and more? Variety. All right? It's not one central idea anymore. It's not one pope in Rome dictating to all Western European Catholics. All right. It shouldn't surprise us, in addition to new thinkings in religion and new thinkings in science, that we will start to have some new thinkings in how we will govern ourselves or how we should be governed. Absolutely. And this is an, uh, an era in Western European history known as the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment. To, like, open your eyes and see the light. Like Buddha. Philosophers and social critics in the 1600s and 1700s will begin to look at how people have a relationship with their governments and begin to question the way a lot of, of, of states are being ruled. For example, many states, and here is Louis XIV of France, to give us an example, are ruling with what we call absolute monarchies. Where the king, Louis XIV, he is famous for saying, I am the state. The, the king is center to all. And he gains his authority, he gains his authority through what is known as divine rights of kings. And we'll talk more about this next week, I believe. That, that the Catholic Church and Louis XIV's connection to it Essentially as God granting Louis the right to rule over France. And so now, not only do people have to follow and obey the laws of the king, because he's king, but it's also connected to their faith. If you don't follow the laws of the king, you'll also run afoul of your church. Now others, others would, would break from the Roman Catholic Church we mentioned, but still place themselves in a central authority with the right to rule from God, like Henry VIII in England. So even though you're not Catholic, there can still be these powerful monarchs who are using uh, religion to help them rule. Well, many thinkers in the 16 and 1700s would start to challenge these notions, and we're going to run through a handful of them here for you. And guys, these are, these are crucial because they're really going to influence what we ultimately become, what France ultimately becomes. Here's John Locke. John Locke in 1689 will write his most important work called Two Treatises on Government, where he says that all men are born equal and all have inalienable rights, rights that can't be ever taken away by anybody, of life and liberty and property, which Thomas Jefferson changes because he doesn't want to get caught by turnitin.com. He changes property to pursuit of happiness, of course. And that people were capable of self-rule, that we as humans could rule ourselves which is big because what is humanism and individualism of the Renaissance always talked about? That we are central. So that's John Locke. Yes, ma'am. Uh, he wrote that in 1689. Thank you. Yes, yes, sir. Did he write that? He wrote Life, Liberty, and Property. Thomas Jefferson wrote Life, Liberty, and Pursuit of Happiness. And so, so did Ho Chi Minh. Yeah, that's what I was saying. Yeah. I was saying I think, I, All right. I know from the in 1762, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. In 1762, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, another Frenchman here, wrote a work called The Social Contract, where he again, like Locke, said that all men are equal. Sorry, ladies. 
and that they should be organized in a government based on the general will of the people. That the people should decide how the people should be ruled. Now this is controversial, living and writing in a country with a king like Louis XIV, or by this time Louis XV and getting into Louis XVI. Yes? So he was advocating for uh, like, 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 uh, democracy or something? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Another Frenchman writing in the early 1700s that you should be familiar with is a guy named Voltaire. who wrote about religious toleration in 1700, early 1700s France, which is a bold idea in Louis XIV's Catholic France, which didn't practice a lot of religious toleration. In fact, France had already smashed their Protestant believers, a group of people known, known as the Huguenots. But we don't need to worry about them today. Another Frenchman. Wow, look at all these people coming from France. And it shouldn't surprise us that they're coming from France because France is the country that had the most absolutist monarchy. And so it wouldn't, shouldn't surprise us that France is going to have a number of thinkers who will challenge that absolute rule. His name was Montesquieu, the Baron de Montesquieu. The Baron of Montesquieu. And he is going to advocate that a government should have its powers divided amongst various branches a legislative branch, an executive branch, a judicial branch. Hey, that sounds like a great idea. Because no one entity like a central king should have all of that authority. So this is Montesquieu arguing for the separation of powers. And last but not least, let's go back to England or Scotland. This is Adam Smith. Adam Smith in 1776 will publish The Wealth of Nations where he supports an individualistic capitalist economy where self-interest should drive people's economic decisions rather than the mercantilist ideas that had been working in European states prior. Mercant or individualist, capitalist, rather than mercantilist. Now, all of these guys, how can we lump them all together? It's focusing on the human existence. Focusing on our world, ourselves, individualist ideas that didn't previously exist when people's supreme focus on earth was just connecting with the spiritual realm so they can get into heaven afterwards. Good.